Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. Um, I'm David Cooperwriter, the Fairmont Minerals Professor of Social Entrepreneurship at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. And I, I really am delighted to be here today, and it's my pleasure to introduce Admiral Jonathan Greenert, our 30th Chief of Naval Operations. Admiral Greenert is the Senior Officer of the Department of the Navy. The CNO is a four-star admiral and is responsible to the Secretary of the Navy for general naval operations and efficiencies, as well as management of personnel, something of a hot button in recent months. To wrap your head around Admiral Greenard's job, let me throw us some numbers at you. The admiral is responsible for 320,000 active duty personnel, 110,000 reservists, 200,000 civilians employed by the Navy. There are approximately 95 ships deployed and about 3,700 operational aircraft around the world. He's responsible for all of that, plus dealing with the impact of sequestration, the automatic spending cuts, and the implement, implementing modifications to naval policies across all naval personnel. In other words, organizational change at an incredibly large scale at a time of diminishing resources and high profile crises. So that's what we're going to hear about today. This is part of the City Club's Business Leaders Series, and the CNO leads one of the world's largest enterprises. It's an organization that plays, obviously, a vital role in so many ways in commerce, and not just in, pro in providing work for defense contractors, though that is significant too. Uh, the Navy has a strong history of leadership in the quest for innovation. In 2001, um, the CNO at that time, Ver Admiral Vernon Clark, led several appreciative inquiry summits, large group, whole system in the room, planning and design sessions that I was pr privileged to facilitate. The goal of this activity was to create bold and enlightened leaders at every level, and Admiral Greenert has carried on this tradition. He knows how to inspire. Indeed, following his command of the USS Honolulu, Admiral Greener was presented the Admiral Stockdale Award for Inspirational Leadership, one of the highest leadership honors one can receive. I'll now invite Admiral to address us here, and after his brief remarks, I'll put the Admiral in the hot seat, okay, <laughs> to, discuss, <laughs> to discuss how he manages an enterprise the size of Ford Motor Cars and Boeing combined. Our Navy could not be in better hands. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Admiral Greener. Thank you very much. It's, it is not lost on me, uh, this August club, the City Club of Cleveland, and I've been uh, very excited of looking quite forward to being here. So uh, what I'd like to uh, talk about today is a little bit about what your Navy is doing around the world, sort of situated, and give you kind of the essence of what I tell my boardroom, my wardroom, our ready room, and even down in the bowels of the ships and the aircraft uh, hangar bays, what I expect our people to talk about. But I will at first violate the first, some of the first principles uh, of speaking, which is never apologize up front. But I have to do this. I have to come clean with all of you. I was born and raised near Pittsburgh. <laughs> okay. I figure it can't get but better from here. Uh, and I came here about three years ago for Fleet Week. And, uh, and I was going on, a, I was telling Dan, I was going on a morning talk show. And uh, they said, well, hello, welcome, it's good to have you, Navy, yada, yada. It was very nice, very, very nice individual, the, the DJ and, and the, the moderator. And he said, so where'd you grow up? And I told him, and he said, he was stone cold, he said, look, do me a favor, I would rather have you curse over and over on my show. <laughs> Don't tell them where you came from. My ratings will plummet, I'll be fired. I said, okay. But... <clears throat> I am a proud Pittsburgh Pirate fan. We have a team this year. You've always had a baseball team. We have one this year, and I think this could be it. <laughs> and I'm, I am taken by uh, this city and its recent sort of renowned uh, incident, and that is the, the case of the four foul balls, which an individual, right? An individual, if you're not familiar, a fan on Sunday's game against the Royals, a guy by the name of Greg Van Neal, he, he caught four foul balls. It's never been done before. 
What are the odds? One in a trillion, for what it's worth. The odds are one in a thousand that you get one. And he got four. And the, the thing that I would leave with you is, the, the, I'm very proud to be from this area of the country. And this is what is, to me, classic about folks from this part of the country. He gave all four of those famous things away, never thought of it, to kids. And he said, here you go. And people said, are you crazy? And he said, no, I'm not crazy. It's for the kids. That's what this game is about, so that they'll become a fan like me. And that's what I think uh, this part of the country is like, and that's why I'm very proud to be from this gentleman area of the country. But I do, uh, as Chief of Naval Operations, David gave some of that, and it may seem uh, like a, you know, a big deal and, and challenging, but I tell you what, I have the greatest job in the world because I get to organize, I get to train, I get to equip your sons, daughters, nephews, nieces, grandchildren, the people who will stand up and be willing to raise their right hand to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and be willing to do that, and they're not after money, they're not after fame or fortune or anything else, and they come back again and again. Our retention is very high, despite all of what you read, and our recruiting is uh, very good. We have not missed a month in recruiting in five years. Uh, our high school uh, equivalency, if you will, and scores are in the 99 percentile. We shoot for 95, uh, and so we have no shortage of talent, but we do have big challenges. They, this is, you know the demographics of this great nation of ours are evolving, and similarly, the demographics of your Navy need to evolve, and that's a big deal for me. So, yes, I organize, train, and I equip, and I lead. I set policy for folks. I don't operate the ships. It's not a giant foosball game, you know, from Washington. Although I would tell you my fleet commanders may have a different opinion when I call them up occasionally and give them advice. But uh, what, what it is is also about thinking of the future. It's building the right ships, the right aircraft, thinking about it, the things that David said. What kind of leaders? do we need in the future? How do we form the right team? Because our kids of today, are, they're very smart. They're very connected. They get it. They know things. They know that they can contribute so much, and they do every single day. So I have to also develop that diverse workforce of the future in the Navy. Uh, gender, uh, most of the college graduates today are female. We need many more women in there leading our Navy and ethnically and professionally and geographically we need to be distributed because as all of you who are business executives, you know, a, a diverse organization will far and away always outperform one that isn't as diverse. But about your Navy, if I may, two fundamental qualities make up what I call our mandate. What are we responsible to do? And that is to be where it matters around this world when it matters. And that's the bottom line. That's what we owe you. That's what we owe this nation to be there when it matters, when it matters. Did you put up the first slide? So in simplistic form, I'll, I'll just kind of bear with me. I'll walk you through this. It's it, it, 70% of the world is covered with water. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we have to remind people, even in the Pentagon, we've been very busy in ground wars, but the vast majority of what's going on out there is over water. And you know what? That is ungoverned in many cases, and it's free space that we operate, that we all operate. So that includes pirates and bandits and smugglers and things of that nature in, in addition to countries uh, that have a governance. Eighty percent of the world population live within a hundred miles of the coast. And so when there are, for example, in Southeast Asia, the ring of fire in that regard, when there are typhoons, when there are volcanoes, when there are tsunamis, it affects a lot of the world in and around the world. So this is the challenge. Go to the next one, please. 90% of the world, many of you have seen this before, but I want you to just think about this, of the world trade by volume, not by, by uh, value, travels by water, and the quality of life of this world of ours really does depend uh, on the ocean and free access to it. We're very interconnected. Uh, the many, many books, the world is flat, and Thomas Friedman would also tell you, and it's hyper-connected in addition to being flat uh, today. And so uh, an effect in one part of the world, the Strait of Hormuz, affects all of us. Uh, one dollar change in the, the price of a barrel of oil in my little world is $30 million in our fuel bill. And so last year we had one heck of a roller coaster ride. It was better than Cedar Point. I mean, in, in, in March, the price of a barrel of oil went up $20. So my bill went up $600 million. And then lo and behold, by August, man, it was down 30 
$30. And so we, we were awash in cash all of a sudden. But that's no way to run a Navy or a railroad. Uh, we, we have to pursue and understand uh, both the cost of fuel, and that, that leads toward the freedom from perhaps petroleum, but also understanding and making sure that it isn't interrupted and that we don't perturbate the things. Uh, that can change uh, that, that volume of production that moves throughout the world. Uh, smartphones are assembled all around the world. I mean, everybody's got a smartphone. Uh, I shouldn't say assembled all around the world. Their pieces are made all around the world. Many of them are assembled in China, Taiwan, and there. But they, the microchips, the, the touch screens, the circuit boards from Korea, Taiwan, Britain, and many others, and they've got to get there. Uh, and they've got to get there through the various and sundry choke points or crossroads that we talk about. The uh, Ford engine plant here in Cleveland, uh, their Echo Boost engine requires greater than 60 global parts that all have to come here uh, for assembly. And they come from Taiwan, Brazil, Japan, and China, just to kind of give you an example of that alone. Electronic control modules, fuel pumps, fasteners, you name it. And it has to get around uh, in various transnational uh, places. And so go to the next one, please. Um, I sort of identify when I took the watch, what are these maritime crossroads, I call them. You can call them choke points. This is a bow tie to some of you who may be attorneys and business people. Those of you who are engineers say, of course not. That's a valve symbol. Uh, you pick it. But I think you see the point. It's a, it's a flow point uh, around the world. In Gibraltar alone, 14% uh, of the world's traffic, $2 trillion in value. Bab el Mendeb Straits by the Red Sea, just past the Suez Canal, where there's unrest today in a country that is very important to the Middle East. Uh, Bab el Mendeb, 9% of the world traffic, $1.5 trillion. Strait of Hormuz, a third of the global petroleum. Now, the good news, if you look around our country, you say, you know, we will be, we're, we get about 10% of our petroleum through the Strait of Hormuz. And that's not nearly as much as you may think. We figure we'll be independent of that petroleum source in uh, a decade or so. But we're so connected to everybody else who needs it, Japan, China, others, that it, we're not free of this issue. So disruption at any one of these is quite costly and is a big deal. So important that we have access to these crossroads. Go to the next one, please. So I bring this up to you. These, the round dots are our bases. Sovereign territory, and that includes all the way out in the Western Pacific, Guam. That is a base of ours. We have a base, obviously, in Hawaii, and you'll see that. But I call your attention to the squares. Those are places around the world where we stop to rest, relax, uh, to resupply, and to repair. And these are generally places where allies invite us in, such as Japan, where we have 24 ships there with sailors, with families, and we call that the forward deployed naval force. Why is that important? Well, when somebody like our friend Kim Jong-un decides that uh, they're going to rattle the saber, if you will, and threaten to launch a ballistic missile, we can respond with missile defense in like three days, as we did. But if we got a haul all the way from San Diego or even from Hawaii and that, that'd take over a week. Well, we don't have a week. We've got to be where it matters, when it matters, to, to be sure we can respond. If you look at Singapore, down there by the Strait of Malacca, Singapore has invited us to bring some ships and forward station down there, and we're in the process of doing that. So you can see that Southeast Asia piece where we can influence matters there. If you go to Rota, Spain, there at Strait of Gibraltar, Rota has invited us to station ships and families and sailors there for missile, ballistic missile defense in the European theater. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I have to designate 10 ships to cycle back and forth from the East Coast, whereas in the future we'll have four ships there. So the value of being able to keep our ships forward in some manner, the value of being there when it matters, when it, uh, to be there, excuse me, when, where it matters, when it matters, and to be ready is vitally important for the economic uh, circumstances and consequences, and that's what we're about. So today, uh, go to the next one, please. We have, in your Navy, 286 ships. And if you do the count of what is out there and about, if you happen to be pretty quick at that, you get about 100 ships, about one-third 
of the ships that we have are out and about, out around the world at different places. You will see here, if you go to the Western Pacific, most of the 153 are in the Western Pacific. We have started to rebalance, if you've heard that term, toward the Asia Pacific region. We've been out there for decades. We've had friends and partners out there. You can see the squares, the places where people invite us. So we've been out and about for some time and will continue to be there. Where I have non-rotational indicated up there, that's, that's that piece of having ships stationed forward. Either they're the forward deployed naval force or we'll put a ship there and rotate the crew. The sailors may not live there, but they'll operate in and out of a port and they'll, they'll ro they'll, they will non-rotate. They'll be there. And you can respond. You're, our kids are ambassadors in that regard because they're there almost all the time. And also you're nurturing the partnership of the region. So out and around the world, you'll see the value of the Western Pacific already. You'll see the value of the Arabian Gulf and the fact that, yeah, we're there and we have been there a while. We have increased from probably a decade ago about 15, 18 ships to 27 there in the Arabian Gulf area. All important aspects of your Navy, why it needs to be, when it, where it matters, when it matters out and about. Let me leave you with... Uh, we were talking at the table uh, today, you know, how do you communicate to your, a big organization? I mean, how do you get down and say, all right, here's, in my parlance, this is the course we're on and this is where we're going. And I tell our folks, it's down to six words, that I need you all to think. These are the lens through which I want you to make all of your decisions and think about what's up next. The first lens is war fighting is first. Because what we owe all of you, if the case may be where we have to go out and go into combat, is to be the best. So whatever we're going to do, whatever decision we make, personnel or otherwise, how does that improve or make us more efficient at war fighting? Second is operate forward, the second two sets of words, number three and number four. Operate forward, and we just talked about that here. And lastly, and I think you can understand this, be ready. Be ready so that we can respond when called upon. Be ready so that you are building and nurturing the right kind of people that they can go out there and when you have commanders of the units with your sons, daughters, nephews, nieces, and grandchildren aboard, commanders who are confident in what they do, willing to be goal, bold in what they are asked to do, and willing to be accountable for their actions and the actions of their unit. So thank you very much. I'm very proud of these folks. I know you are too, if you know any of them, what they do, and they're very proud of what they do. <clears throat> one last word. If you see them, tell them thanks. And ask them one more thing. Ask them what they do. But you better be ready, because they're going to tell you what they do. They're very proud of it, and they'll talk a long time. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Admiral Greenert, and um, it's, it's, as I listen to you speak with such pride and sense of honor and sense of purpose on behalf of all of us, um, I can only imagine what it felt like, you know, what a thrill it must have been or surprise when you were selected as CNO of the United States Navy. And I'm just wondering if you can just share with us a little bit personally what your feelings were when you were approached with that job and, um, and, and how did you go about your first hundred days? Well, I would tell you that in the little town of Butler, Pennsylvania, they said, really? <laughs> Him? Uh, I, was, I was overwhelmed with, uh, it's very humility, uh, it makes you feel very humble. It's big. Uh, to, to feel, oh boy, I gotta do all this. But I, I had a sense for the fact that uh, what I described where there were storm clouds in the in the distance. Things were running pretty well there. Uh, my predecessor had put us on a good course, if you will, in speed. So I thought the Navy was in general going in the right direction. Uh, but I knew we had uh, these changes coming about. As we know today, sequestration. I knew the defense budget was going to change and we were going to get smaller. It was inevitable. Yeah. And, that, and so my thinking was how to get that simple message out. Because I didn't want our kids to get wrapped up, nor me or my executives, in the, the pulling here and there and the changing of vectors that would inevitably, and are, yeah. taking place. Yeah. And therefore, the six words I mentioned there. And so uh, I got a transition team, a group of 
people who are from various walks of life, from engineering to personnel to political military, all uh, naval officers and mm -hmm. some civilians, because we have great civilian leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I call them our civilian sailors, mm -hmm. called senior mm -hmm. executive service, government employees. You have many here in the Cleveland area mm -hmm. at, uh, at DFAS here. Mm -hmm. Together, and we, we put together a plan. I called it sailing direction. So I uh -huh. spent uh, a good bit of my first hundred days articulating sailing directions. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a mariner, you go out on the lake, uh, and you're going to go from, I don't know, here to Duluth, uh, you will go to a book called Sailing Directions, and it will tell you, here's where you lay out the course, here's where the shoal water is, here are the buoys, and I tried to lay that out and say, okay, here's where we're going. Uh, I spoke a bit of it here, and it was, I was trying to make it, uh, I can't make it budget-proof, mm -hmm. but I'd like to make it budget-resistant, okay. so that the principles were the same. Yeah, yeah, well, that's great. And, you know, as part of this leadership series here, people are really... Um, all wanting to learn a lot more about, especially at your level, um, you know, the, the, the high points and low points of what it means to be a leader and mm -hmm. the triumphs as well as the um, challenges. And if you could just think through your entire career as a leader, you know, obviously there's been ups and downs and high points and low points, there is for all of us. Can you share a high point moment, a time you felt most effective as a leader, most alive in that work or change or initiative that you were working on. Um, something where, in jazz terms, you felt in the groove as a leader. And just mm -hmm. describe that. Um, there might have been several times, but, you know, can you share one? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, question. I would say that the pinnacle of anybody's career is to be in command uh, of a unit. Mm -hmm. uh, and that usually occurs at what would be the lieutenant colonel uh, level, we call it 05, or in our parlance, commander level, where you're, you are given uh, command of a ship, in my case, a submarine, nuclear submarine. You take that, that group of people, in my case, 130 folks, you put, toss off all the lines and you trundle out to sea for sometimes six weeks at a time, yeah. and you go over to, in my case, the Western Pacific for seven months. Mm -hmm. So the, the high point uh, of it, in fact, my wife would tell you this story, she, uh, not necessarily the high point, the, the first day, the most nervous day, was uh, trying to go to bed at oh. night, and I heard everything, oh. uh, every little clink clank or, or whatever, and I slept like a baby on a submarine. It's a very quiet, cool, little fans going, and to me, it sounded like I was, I was by a jackhammer all right. night long because right. just, just the accountability of yeah. what you have. Yeah. High point was when we received a unit award because the crew was, uh, they knew it was the collective effort uh, of the group. Yeah. And the fact that I was in charge of this group meant more to me than any other medal to be in the chief of naval operations yeah. when you look at that. Yeah. Uh, I would tell you any, any uh, military officer uh, your first command of a unit gives you more uh, satisfaction and more terror, uh, you know, per day uh, than, than any other yeah. that I can think of. Wow. How did you instill that collective sense of responsibility that it really was theirs? That's, uh, boy, that's the trick yeah. and that's uh, what a lot of what your work is. Yeah. Uh, I think it is uh, deciding where we want to go, as I mm -hmm. mentioned, in sailing directions in the Navy. And you've got to just keep and rhythmically uh, keeping it simple right. uh, and keeping it coherent and, and let them know how they're doing in that regard. Yeah. I think that's, and you have to have good people. Yeah. And I was very yeah. fortunate. I had a terrific senior enlisted leader, mm -hmm. John Johnson, okay. and Glenn Niederhauser, my executive officer, mm -hmm. my second in command. And you kind of, they say, you got to keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> As I meet with um, especially CEOs and very top leaders, um, you know, obviously the last 10 years, everything's been about change, you know, and, and becoming change ready and trying to change before the trauma sets in because we don't change well under trauma and anger and fear and so on. So how to anticipate those kinds of changes. But, um, you know, as I sit down with the leaders today, their question has been refined. It's, it's no longer simply about change, but it's change at the scale of the whole. How do we move a whole 67,000 person telephone company together? How do we move a whole Northeast Ohio economic community together? How do we transform a whole Walmart system together? Yeah. 
you know, and, and, and I, I'm assuming that you are um, bumping up against some major challenges where you have to get the hole to move. How do you do that? And can you share an example? Well, the, I'll tell you, the, the biggest challenge right today is, is the sexual assault challenge. Okay. Uh, and that is, uh, so I'll talk about that because yeah. I think it is one, many of the people in this audience, uh, it's real, mm. the, the problem. Uh, it is uh, not completely understood, the degree of it, but it is a reality. Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks, uh, I'd been looking at this actually for some time, and the way to, you, I think you, we have to approach it, and I, all of us, all of the service chiefs, as we've talked about it, mm -hmm. you have to be aware and you have to define the reality. So I would say if you want to take an organization yep. direction, uh, you have to understand the reality of it, and that has to get down there. So yep. for us, it is the awareness that there are, there is uh, sexual harassment to some degree and assaults take place. Mm -hmm. Because if you go around the room and you went around the Navy and you said, I don't know any of these people right. that would do such a thing and right. say, well, uh, we read the reports, they're there. Okay. So it is, it is internalizing yeah. that and understanding that. So that's yeah. kind of one. Then yeah. you have to decide, well, how do we prevent this? What is the climate and atmosphere that you need to create so that to make that change right. of this awareness, you say, well, we have to, you in command, you are responsible to put, put together a climate of dignity and respect uh, that folks are not treated differently, differently due to gender mm -hmm. or any other reason, yeah, yeah. race, you pick it, yeah. and that has to be embedded and imbued. Yeah. Uh, then we move to where are we going to go from here. Right. Take care of the victims in this case, get mm -hmm. them support, and prosecute, hold accountable those that would make that very public mm -hmm. so that there's a deterrent effect. Yeah. And there's a whole host of other fibers that go through that yeah. from trust and understanding uh, and so there are a lot of folks helping us today, the Congress and others. And how do, you, how do you deal with the culture part of it, just being embedded in the culture? Well, you have to uh, repeat it, yep. uh, be yep. repetitive to it. Yep. I think you have to look at it and understand yep. why they may think that way. Yep. You have to start at the beginning when right. folks come into the Navy. And we, mm. we spend a good bit of time putting together a training program for our new recruits. In fact, we talk to them before they even get to boot camp. Yeah, they, yeah. they have an entrance station yeah. that, they, that they come to before they go to boot camp. And then you have to methodically, deliberately, and coherently at each yeah. echelon see how uh, this is a one challenge of leadership. There are others. Yeah. How dignity, respect, integrity, mm. Uh, mm. your expanded level of that. So yeah. a small example. I would expect a very junior enlisted and a junior officer to understand right from wrong what the rules and regulations are and the aspects of dignity and, and other principles. Right. You go to the next level, not only do I expect you to understand that, but right. you also have to be ready and willing to be intrusive to those that don't understand it and right. call that out. Yep. And then it gets broader as you get further. Yeah, yep. yeah. okay. Yeah, uh, so let me build on that a little bit. Um, you know, I mean, the, the honor you received, the Stockdale Award, um, for those of you that know it, I mean, it's really one of the highest, it's called the Stockdale Award for Le Inspirational Leadership. And, um, and, you know, I think this is a real huge question in the field. What is it that causes inspirational leadership? And um, there's some writers that say that uh, leadership is not just an external thing, but it's an inside job that we actually cultivate and become an inspirational model. Where do you go to cultivate your inspiration? How do you cultivate your inspiration? Um, is it, you know, are there people that you have studied, leaders, um, poetry, religion, you know, what, where, where does that inspirational leadership come from for you? Well, I get it, uh, I get it a, a lot from bosses you know, and mentors and others and watching what made them yeah. effective. Uh, I do read biographies here and there. Uh, okay. Nimitz, I thought, was very good. Uh, Admiral yeah. Nimitz from, from World War II, yeah. uh, he was very good. Admiral King, who was the chief of naval operations doing great change right. leading up to World War II and during yeah. World War II. Yeah. And I'll tell you what is, uh, mm. uh, again, uh, I like to laugh at things because mm. I tell you, you know, you start drinking or crying, and neither one of those works. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And so, yeah. 
Uh, but yeah. in all seriousness, some mm -hmm. of the conundrums and challenges and doubts that mm -hmm. people have about is this the right thing mm -hmm. that took place in World War II, in the Korean War and otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, we have today. So yeah. the, it personalizes things. Okay. But I mentioned this yeah. uh, in, the, in my opening remarks, and I do believe this firmly. Uh, this, I come from this area of the country. Hmm. Uh, sometimes I bring my uh, staff with me. We stayed here in Cleveland, and yeah. this happened. Uh, you go ask somebody something and they mm -hmm. stop and they square up and they look at you and they ask you, where are you what are you trying to do? Right. And they help you get to that position. And that yeah. could be an opinion, it could be a discussion, or it could be directions. Yeah. If you look like you're looking for something, people stop and ask you that. Yeah. Uh, it happens in it's Pittsburgh, it happens here. Uh, and I think uh, that's one. Two, there's an element of humility that mm -hmm. I think is imbued in people around here. Yeah. Uh, hey, you're, I'm yeah. just a fortunate kid mm -hmm. from a steel town. You know, my dad was a steel worker. Yeah. And uh, I had a mentor who wrote me whenever I made Admiral. Right. He wrote to me and he said, uh, when you get up in the morning, don't forget to take a humble pill every day with wow. your vitamin. Wow. And wow. it's about service and yeah. understanding that. Yeah. And, uh, and I try to, you know, embed yeah. that in folks to say, take a breath, congratulations, oh, you, you made Admiral, or whatever right. that may be. Okay, now, wow. Wow. <laughs> we've got work to do here, and it's yeah. about taking care uh, of your people and defining their reality and leading them on. Yeah, that sense of purpose and kind of humility and leadership, I think, is just so missing in so many places. But um, thank you for sharing that with us. I, I'm, I'm head of a center. Um, the Fowler Center for Sustainability and in the field of business it's really moving quickly the, um, and, and it's not just in the same old way like we're just trying to do good it's, it's, um, it's really becoming a source of competitive advantage and real out-of-the-box thinking mm -hmm. about how to reduce you know costs and energy at the same time CO2 emissions, um, how to come up with new products that, you know, like, um, <laughs> I just, I, I was in the Netherlands recently and the kids love this. It's a, uh, a, a gym, gym shoe where they went to their designers and said, can you come up with a gym shoe that the kids will love that, uh, that has been made in um, factories powered by renewable energy that after you're done with it, um, instead of going into a landfill, you actually plant the shoe in your backyard and it becomes a tree. I mean, literally, it's called, <laughs> it's called OAT, Shoes That Bloom. But it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a concept, a way of thinking about, yeah. you know, this circular economy mm -hmm. and ecology. Um, where is the Navy at and where do you see the future in terms of some of the um, sustainable innovation? Well, uh, we have got to pursue, I kind of alluded to it, yeah. um, Alternate energy, we have to continue to look at that. Energy is a strategic and it is a part of combat. Right. Uh, we, uh, I have a book being written for me. I'm feeding it in and it's called How We Fight. And the, it's designed to, for somebody to pick up, uh, a junior enlisted or junior officer, to understand the essence of being in the Navy. Number right. one, you're on water. Right. So you will die if you don't stay afloat. Uh, if you're on land, uh, you and I are just sitting right. here. Right. If we were, you know, if right. the thing was afloat, obviously we'd be thinking, right. I hope this thing stays afloat. How right. long can I, you know, you get my point. Yeah. Similarly, <laughs> similarly, uh, where's your next uh, gallon of fuel coming from? Because right. you're going to run out. Similarly, where's your food? Where's your whatever? So yeah. energy is a major, major piece. Right. And, uh, and it defines so much of what I showed up there. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Yeah. Uh, another is looking ahead, laser technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, we were talking mm -hmm. earlier with uh, Dan in the office, and next year uh, we are going to employ or deploy mm -hmm. a ship with a, effectively a laser gun. Uh, mm -hmm. It will have a power level which will be good enough to knock down a small drone yeah. that may be out there and powerful enough to intercept and to disable a uh, speedboat, right. uh, a large speedboat, say a uh, 30, uh, 30 foot uh, boat right. to that. So right. laser technology yeah. would be another. Yeah. Unmanned systems, and yeah. I'm under, on, and above the ocean. Oh, uh, we just recently tested yeah. one. Some of you may have seen it from an aircraft carrier. So an unmanned uh, aerial vehicle, mm -hmm. if you will, system from an aircraft carrier. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, you can take it anywhere in the world because you're on a piece of U.S. sovereignty, an aircraft carrier. Right, so there's right. no land piece to this. Mm -hmm. You can move it wherever you want. That's kind of one. Two, we put incredible amount of weight and systems in the manning piece of yep. an airplane for 
uh, I think you can understand right. for good reason. Right. You replace that weight with anything from fuel to sensors to weapons, and now you have something with tremendous persistence, mm -hmm. 10, 10 hours, 12 hours, not two hours, right. uh, that you can take off there. So right. unmanned yeah. uh, systems uh, is another, and cyber. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the interconnection of the world, networks, getting into them, protecting them. Yeah. Those uh, are three very big elements. Yes. Uh, and then mm -hmm. all underwritten by people, yeah. and that's the diversity piece. We have yeah. to understand and, and mark, go mine that talent in this country of ours, right. which is out in diversity. Right, right. So we were, um, as you were talking, you know, we left a little bit about the need for humor and so on, but, um, you know, a lot of great research is coming out about great leaders um, that shows how positive they are, that we've underestimated the role of the positive in human system leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean not just positive thinking, but positive emotion, being able to, you know, work from the perspective of hope and inspiration and camaraderie and so on. Um, you know, along that kind of balance, um, you know, Peter Drucker talked about the task of leadership is to create, you know, and just notice strengths to, you know, create an alignment of strengths in right. ways that's so strong. But he also argued that we're so problem focused in so many of our management situations that we miss those strengths and those. Where, where do you come out in terms of your, you know, um, sense of the role of the positive in leadership? Uh, it, it is absolutely essential, and I think that uh, I, I grew up uh, in the nuclear arena, if yeah. you will, okay. nuclear propulsion. So um, the concept, uh, so I'm a guy yeah. of deficiency, so I, I had to get out, I'm in therapy now to get out of that, okay. but, but it's going okay, I need to tell you. And what I mean by that is nuclear energy, nuclear right. propulsion, right. by definition, is a beautiful, wonderful thing that can provide en enormous things. Mm -hmm. But there are no the consequences of deficiencies within it. Yeah. But first thing you got to do is create that centerpiece, which in this case was uh, nuclear fission. Yeah. But once you have that and you can mm -hmm. harness that energy, you're now looking at the deficiency piece. Right. But you got to have that first. So. Right. Uh, I'm looking for today uh, asymmetric approaches to things uh, that allow us to do things like ensure we have access anywhere in the world, the mm -hmm. undersea domain, the cyber domain, our yeah. networks, yeah. Uh, a capability in the electromagnetic spectrum, which mm. your cell phones, your Wi-Fi, we're all over the yeah. electromagnetic spectrum. When it comes to people, uh, I look for managers that can provide that infectious piece we are lucky we have an all-volunteer force. Right. By the way, this right. month is the 40th right. anniversary yeah. of the all-volunteer force, July. That's quite amazing. It seems yeah. amazing. It's 40 yeah. years. And uh, all the technology of the world and the things we're chatting about, yeah. all underwritten by the all-volunteer force. Yeah. So these are people that are here for a reason. Right. They're increasingly well-educated. So you, you drive toward the strengths and let them right. you know, grasp that and, yeah. and go on. And, and grow and develop. And grow and develop folks. into yeah. it. Yeah. And as we move into the future here, yeah. there are some elements uh, that I kind of define. You said, what about the future? We need to nurture and, and focus and invest in mm -hmm. and let, them, let that carry us to the future rather than worrying as much about the deficiencies of we don't have money for this, that, and the other thing. Right. We're going to have to cut some things free. Right. And in the world that we live in, federal world and bureauc bureaucratic world connected to a lot of, of special interests, right. this is going to be hard. But yep. without it, uh, we'll just slowly chop ourselves down to an average organization. Yeah. Good. So I think we'll invite some questions in All a right. few minutes. But let me just ask one more. One of the things that was really surprising and exciting for me when I just you know, began to work with Admiral Clark, I didn't realize how much of the Navy's work was humanitarian assistance. You know? Can you just share a little bit about the magnitude of that? Yeah. Sure, I would. Thank you. If you consider uh, just, as I mentioned, Southeast Asia, and uh, I was talking about how many folks live near the water, uh, the ocean, and um, Every year, 70,000 people in the Asia Pacific region die due to a natural disaster of some sort. Um, a tsunami, a, uh, not so much those, but volcanoes and, and typhoons predominantly. But there are a number of, of things that go on. Well, we have to be able to respond to those. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is a, 
a good common link for navies to how do we collectively organize ourselves to respond. So uh, our approach in the U.S. Navy, we are uh, built and by, by the Constitution and by the direction of the will of the people, we protect this country and we will project power as necessary. Right. So how we do that, how we theorize that and mm. produce it in three-dimensional terms is what it is. Yeah. We, you have to be able to project, in some cases, comfort and project care. So instead of delivering bombs, we're delivering water and food and otherwise. And that uh, understanding has made us actually pretty good at responding to uh, a, an earthquake and tsunami in yeah. Japan, yeah. which uh, causes a problem of just the disaster itself, the collapse of things, the loss of general mm -hmm. uh, basics and radiation all, yeah. all around. So you have That's to figure right. out, hmm, That's how do I get in all this, yeah. protect the people who are delivering it, and get the, you get yeah. the comfort there. Yeah. So what I'm telling you, David, is uh, it is becoming a, uh, a basic skill yeah. uh, to us. But it is analogous to what we do. It's sort of woven in our DNA right. to do that. Right. It is also something that resonates That's with the Russians, the Chinese, even the Iranians, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Uh, and so we who get to see in this international peace that is not governed by any country, yeah. Yeah. when we get together out there, it is a common ground we can work on. That's great. Yep. I'm Hello. Dan Malthrop, back for just a few mid-forum announcements. Uh, today, the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a special forum on leadership featuring Admiral Jonathan Greenert, Chief of Naval Operations, in conversation with Cleveland's own David Cooper Ryder, Dr. David Cooper Ryder, Fairmount Minerals Professor of Organizational Behavior at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. We'll return momentarily to our traditional City Club questions and answers. This is your opportunity, though, to figure out what your excellent question is going to be. If you're watching live on our webcast, you should know that's supported by the University of Akron, and we're eternally grateful to them for that service. I want to let you know about a, uh, an upcoming event, Friday, August 9th. This is a very special event. The City Club is pleased to welcome Stephen Lieber, President and CEO of the Healthcare Information and Management Systems Society, also known as HIMSS. They are the largest tenant of the new Global Center for Health Innovation. Uh, you formerly knew that as the MedMart, you now know it as the Globe, and uh, we're going to be hosting that event there at the Globe. We encourage you to join us there, and if you do, we'll throw in a tour, so give it some thought. That's on, um, that's on August 9th, as I said. There's more information at cityclub.org. I'd like to welcome guests at table, uh, today at tables hosted by Falls Communication, Humana, Huntington Bank, Inside Business, Meaden and More. Parker Hannafin, and the U.S. Naval Academy alumni Cleveland, along with the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. Thank you very much for your support. Today's program is part of our Business Leaders series brought to you and us by uh, Inside Business Magazine and the generous support of Huntington Bank, along with Meaden and Moore, Humana, Fall and Falls Communication. Thank you all for your support of this series. I'd also like to thank uh, one other person without whom this, uh, this may never have happened. My predecessor, Jim Foster, is here, whose incomparable connections uh, really made this, made this happen. Jim, thank you so much. <laughs> you. Jim, it should be noted, is, a former, uh, is an Air Force veteran. Um, and now, yes, we're all joined. You're, you're okay. You're okay. I'm okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we'll return to our, uh, our uh, Dr. Cooper Ryder and Admiral Greenert for our traditional question and answers. Holding the microphones are City Club Program Director Carrie Miller and Development Associate Mike Cromaldi. And um, please, first question. Admiral, um, you mentioned in your remarks uh, nuclear propulsion. Uh, and obviously the Navy now has, what, five decades or so of experience in terms of use of that uh, technology in terms of uh, powering ships. Um, if you could comment on what has been the Navy's experience with that uh, propulsion system, in other words, how efficient it is, has it been for you, and looking forward, do you think that that sector is going to expand or remain about the same in terms of the Navy's future uh, use of power? Thank you for the question. It, it has been a boon, I think, for the Navy, and what I mean by that is this. We, nuclear technology has, has us to the point now where uh, when we build uh, what is today, we build nuclear submarines, nuclear-powered submarines, and aircraft carriers. We have not found it to be very efficient to go really beyond that at this point. Uh, we can put fuel in a submarine and an aircraft carrier for the life of the submarine and for half the life 
of the aircraft carrier. That means 30 years for a submarine, 25 years for each core on an aircraft carrier, 50 years total. And uh, that means you don't worry about fueling, as I mentioned, you know, before you're out on the, on the ocean, you go wherever you need, where you need to be, uh, pretty much as fast as you need. And, and that, um, that has saved space on an aircraft carrier, where you can now put ammunition, airplanes, people, and other systems. And so it has been uh, a really a terrific, asymmetric, if you will, transformational aspect uh, for the U.S. Navy. Admiral, uh, first, thank you so much for devoting your life to keeping us safe. Yeah, we appreciate it very, very much. Second, um, I love the fact you referred to it as our Navy. It instills a sense of pride, so thank you again for that. Yeah. Question, what's your most difficult thing that you face right now, and if there's anything that we as citizens can help? I think the most difficult thing uh, is to uh, help define uh, and provide for my boss, the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of Defense, the best Navy money can buy uh, in a period of uh, what I'll call sequestration, a lower bu uh, budget. Uh, it is my opinion uh, that that decision has been made, that, that the decision, if you will, of the will of the people by virtue of uh, what we've been given, that that we're going to dramatically reduce the defense budget. So what is the most efficient and effective Navy that we can have? One that operates forward where it matters, when it matters, uh, attracts diverse uh, people who of, of all different skill sets, uh, has an industrial base that can expand as necessary, reconstitute a Navy, uh, and a Navy which has the right platforms to put the right payloads in. And what I mean by that is, uh, in so many years, we've built ships that are very integrated in their systems, teeming with guns and missile launchers, very proud, very nice looking items. But as time goes on, these systems become obsolete in today's turnover of technology and systems. So to define the right kind of ships and aircraft that can stay, uh, if you will, uh, uh, modernized, be able to be modernized, modern, modernized, excuse me, and bring payloads, effective payloads onto them to help define those elements. Uh, that's, that's my big challenge. Uh, we're in, in the midst of that challenge as we start through the summer uh, into the fall and the next year. Admiral, thank you for, uh, for your time here today. You mentioned at the beginning of your remarks that um, the Navy has met its recruiting goal for the last five years. Well, we all know that the economy wasn't exactly very good throughout the country and throughout the world for that matter. Right. How do you assure that as the economy improves that the Navy and the other services continue to meet their recruiting goals? Yeah, that, that is an excellent question. And uh, I think we, we have to go where the talent is. We have to go out and understand where that is. And that gets to my diversity point. Because today, we're, we don't, uh, in our enlisted ranks, we pretty much uh, have a nice mixture, if you will, of, of diverse folks all, all around. But we don't in the officer ranks. We have to look and understand the demographics of the country and where that talent is. Mm -hmm. Today, the, uh, an average kid coming out of high school uh, we can, uh, is eligible, if you will, just eligible, let alone qualified, to join the service, one out of four. One out of four. And the reason is it can be physical, it can be a rest record, it can be this, that, or the other thing. But that's, and, and capability-wise, if you will, uh, potential aptitude. So that's not sustainable if, it, if that's where we recruit in the future. So we need to expand our recruiting. We need to inject, and where folks can help us is inject, we call it STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, to embed and imbue the interest of that in our kids today uh, so then when I go to recruit them and bring them into a, a, an organization which is founded on math uh, and science and, and engineering, that there's a resonance there and they, they can be capable. So we've got to go out and find where that talent is. That's the bottom line. And we're starting in that direction. Thank you for the question. First, I want to thank you for your service. Um, I've had the privilege to visit and study pretty carefully all the character-based approach at West Point and the Air Force Academy and the Stockdale Ethics Center. I use really small words and talk slowly when I was at the other two facilities. Stockdale was by far superior. Um, 
two questions. Which part of character education do you feel really good about? And, and in light of some of the challenges around sexual harassment, where do you think some of the growth needs to be? I feel pretty good about uh, leadership from the perspective of what does it take to be an effective leader. Uh, that's people who are competent to lead our organizations, both officer and enlisted, lead my organization within my organization. I'm reasonably good uh, good with that. And what I mean by that is they go out, they can sail the ships, they understand the tactics, they understand how to tell our people what to do and to nurture and bring them along. What I don't feel as good about, and I've started an initiative in that, is the character development, behavior. What is the appropriate behavior? Understanding things as basic as integrity. If we don't understand integrity, and I, I tell the kids there's only one way, only one thing that you have to give up among many other things is integrity. Nobody can take it from you. You give it up in some way. And that is so important because it's the foundation. We have to believe anything we are told by those that are in them and among that team. We can't get into that doubting. It just won't work. And you've, I'm sure you're familiar with any kind of military stories that, that would go into that and what that foundation was. So our kids that come in today, we have to put that foundation in there. So uh, this, this idea of your behavior, your character development, as they go through the challenge of leadership, and it's officer and enlisted, that they understand that, that their, uh, their uh, loyalty has to be to the institution. They raise their right hand and said, support and defend the Constitution of the United States and bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution. Not true faith and allegiance to their buddy, to the group, to the gaggle of whatever they were. That's kind of good, no man left behind and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember ultimately who it is that you are, you know, who, where your allegiance. That's kind of one piece. The integrity is another. The other is to understand that as you go through challenges, uh, you could start evolving in a good way, but maybe not so good way. Some people get kind of mean whenever they go through increased responsibility and they have trouble with accountability. Mm -hmm. Others are so brilliant, they have never really had to depend on anybody else, but in the <laughs> In the, in the, where we are, you know, in the military, you have to depend on other people. And you have to learn to understand that and accept the accountability of the unit for that. Well, I didn't make that decision. Well, it was made and you're responsible for it. So let's, let's work through that. So that's the part we need to work on. Uh, we are a product of society. Uh, our society is generally pretty good on that. But we need to tweak that up because the consequences are high. Yeah, but you believe character can be developed. I do. Yeah. Uh, I do. Uh, I said there's, a, in our kids today, they understand leadership. They are willing yeah. to be part of a bigger, that's why, I mean, yes. they joined the all-volunteer yeah. force, and they're yeah. coming to us in the good numbers. Right. But some of them say, well, how many of you cheated in high school? And you'll right. get an enormous number. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Hmm. Well, it was just this. And so you say, okay, kiddo, where do you draw the line there? Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you're going to go run a nuclear reactor, right. fly an airplane, do a parachute for this person. Yep. Where, where do you draw that line? And we have to see that's a tough line yeah, to draw. I think it's a big question. And you know, all of our society can look to um, the Navy, I think, as I've you know, interacted, just the capacity to build character. And it's a big debate in education, for example. Can we, in the public schools, be teaching character? And, um, but I think we've got models here. So I love your question about character. Yeah, I do too. Um, and just as a resource, um, in Cincinnati, the Meyerson Foundation commissioned a big, big study that came up with a kind of an encyclopedia of human strengths. And it's all a, a vocabulary and language about character, you know, humility and wisdom and courage and so on. And um, great tools. You can go onto their website. It's called VIA Character Strengths, V-I-A. Um, but thank you for, you know, for that. Because I, I think too often we think that we can't deal with character. And especially in education, we need to bring that into the heart of our learning process. Yep. And we owe, uh, we as an institution, we're only here so long. Yep. I, I mean, life is only 20 years, yep. you know, a life -er. yeah. But these people, uh, we will return them to communities. And so I view it as my responsibility to return people of character. That's great. Admiral, thank you for your service. 
and maybe more important thanks to your family and to all the families and the service people in the room. Just as important, I think. Uh, the Army's been able to hone its skills in the last 20 years. Uh, they've been at war. And from a leadership standpoint, how is the Navy seeding those lessons learned from the Middle East to the lessons that may need to be learned so PACOM, Pacific Command, is ready to go to war if they have to? Uh, that, too, is a good question. We have provided on the order of about, uh, at any one time, 7,000 folks to, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it was 10,000 folks for, of the last 10 years, I'd say six of those years, we were at a level of 10,000 folks ashore. So frankly, at any given time in the Middle East, we had more people ashore than we had afloat. Uh, these were generally uh, doctors, they were logisticians, they were engineers, they were planners, uh, but they were also sailors that went ashore and just to learn and contribute to that. And we called those, they augmented various uh, Army and Marine Corps units and Special Forces units. And they were individuals provided to augment the unit, therefore we called them individual augmentees, IAs. It had to be an acronym, you have to have that. <laughs> uh, we, these people roll back into organizations, our organizations in the service, and we learn a great deal about that. We learn uh, how do the other, what are the good cultures and the aspects of, of the Army, very strong in doctrine, very strong in planning and understanding how to put uh, a, a, scheme, a scheme together, if you will, and the scheme of maneuver around. So we have to, those, are, those folks, a lot of them, especially the junior officers, uh, my A, Danielle, did this quite a bit. She's an intelligence officer. She spent quite a bit of time with uh, the SEALs uh, in Iraq. And so Danielle will come back into the Navy and so bring that, that learning. That in, and so we need to embed and see that uh, out there. What are the, what are the key skills uh, for that? Uh, and so we got to do that right and not lean them over in this direction or channelize them over another direction and prevent them for this stuff from attriting out as we go through years of uh, no land combat. Admiral, it's great to hear from a fellow submariner. Thanks for being here and for your leadership of the whole Navy. Um, I'm interested to know if you were trained directly or indirectly by Admiral Rickover, and what can you say about his leadership, and how did it help you become a leader yourself? <laughs> well, I did. I learned when I, I was interviewed, in fact, by him. It lasted about 20 seconds, and uh, <laughs> there's an old saying: uh, "Say what you mean, and mean what you say." And uh, he asked me, "Why have my class standing keep going down?" Well, I was going to say, you know, I'm thinking to myself, my grades were actually going up. They were creeping up, ladies and gentlemen. They weren't moving fast. But more, more people were leaving the academy at the time. This is the uh, middle to late 70s. So my class standing, so I was going to try and tell them the courses got harder, and I didn't study as much. The only thing I got out of my mouth was the courses got harder. And he said, get out of here. <laughs> so... Um, we learned a, a host of things that actually I read in books. Uh, you get what you inspect and not what you expect. You should understand who, who exactly you're going to put around you. Therefore, every officer in his organization and in his program was interviewed by him. Uh, I interview everybody that's going to join my staff because you put, you put great trust and confidence. He was big on accountability. Uh, and so there's an element of accountability that uh, I think we understand reasonably well. And he was very big on understanding risk. Risk is what is the likelihood of something happening versus the consequences. If the likelihood is low or the consequences aren't all that high, you take more risk. And in nuclear propulsion, the consequences are extremely high. Nuclear weapons, aircraft flying, and things of that nature regardless of the likelihood. So understanding risk, which is a word we throw around in the Department of Defense and that we're going to take more risk and this, that, and the other thing. Well, what does that mean? Is there less likelihood? More? How do you balance that? Uh, I thought he was brilliant in that regard and ahead of his time. Well, I want to thank both of you, Admiral Jonathan Greenert, thank you for your service to our country in defense of our liberties, in particular the First Amendment, we're pretty big on that here. And Dr. David Cooper Ryder, thank you very much for facilitating an absolutely fascinating conversation about leadership. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our